Good morning, let's get started. So one of the first things that we analyzed in this course in electrostatics was the parallel plate capacitor. So I'd like to remind you of what we had seen uh, in terms of this uh, parallel plate and the electric field that it supports. So the parallel plate capacitor is uh, a system of two conducting plates. Something like this. Okay. And then if we have width of the plates, W, length L, the height is H. Typically, we sandwich a dielectric in between the plates to make sure that there is no uh, current from the one plate to the other. So we can have in between here a dielectric epsilon naught epsilon r. And if we consider a coordinate system like the one that we used to analyze the structure with uh, the z axis pointing upwards, you remember that we had found with Gauss's law that there is an electric field and that electric field is supported in between the plates. It points from the upper plate to the lower plate. So it is in the minus z direction. And it is equal. It can be expressed in two ways. It can be expressed in terms of the surface charge density on the plate. So if this has charge plus q and this has charge minus q, we have a surface charge density rho sub s. So the electric field can be expressed as rho sub s by epsilon. That was actually the original expression that we derived with Gauss's law. And that rho sub s can be expressed now that we have the geometry as the charge divided by the area because it is charge per unit area. So if I have charge Q over area WL, then uh, the uh, surface charge density is Q divided by WL. So let me make a note for those who have forgotten the notation that this rho sub s is surface charge density in coulombs per meter squared. We had an alternative way of expressing the uh, field in the capacitor in terms of the voltage between the plates. If you remember, because the conductors are equipotential surfaces, uh, the potential on any point on this plate is the same as at any other point. And then we can define a potential difference, V, between the plates of the capacitor. Let me call this V sub C. And in having this uh, voltage, we can express the electric field in volts per meter as minus voltage divided by the height. Indeed, you can see that if you integrate the electric field, take E dot DL from the upper plate to the lower plate, you will find the potential difference. Indeed, the potential difference is uh, integral of the electric field from point A to point B. Uh, as uh, you may remember, work per unit charge. That is the potential difference, the physical meaning. When you buy a battery of 1.5 volt, that means that the battery does work of 1.5 joule per coulomb to move a charge from the one pole to the other. So V sub C is the voltage between, or the potential difference, as we could formally call it, between the plates. And we had derived the quantity called the capacitance C that is uh, charge divided by voltage. And we had shown that it can be expressed in terms of the material epsilon, the dielectric permittivity, times the area of the plates, which is W times L divided by the height. This is a well-known formula that you probably saw even before 
university that the capacitance in farad is expressed as epsilon times area divided by uh, separation. So you see that this is independent, and that's the whole point that we care about capacitance. It's independent of the voltage and the charge. So uh, when you uh, pick up a capacitor that is 10 nanofarad from an electronic store, that is not dependent on whether you will connect it to a 1.5 volt source or a 3 volt source. It has to deliver the same kind of capacitance, and indeed you see from the formula that we derived that it depends only on the geometry and the material that you use to build the capacitor. So this is what we know about the capacitor and we have uh, known this since electrostatics. So now let's uh, go and take a capacitor like this and connect it to an AC source, an alternating current source. So now we are talking about a circuit, a circuit that you have also seen. I don't claim that I'm the first person to show it to you. So this is uh, now a generator, V sub G. So this is a, an alternating current source. And I make a circuit by taking this capacitor, flipping it a little bit by 90 degrees, and connecting it to the circuit, to the source. Just like that. Okay, so this is it, and uh, the z-axis now points this way. So you see I have flipped the capacitor and then connected to a circuit. Okay. So now what happens in this case is that if the source pushes some extra positive charge dq, so by the way, in between the capacitor, we have this electric field that I drew before. So I will draw it again. So now consider that uh, over time dt We have the source that drives some extra charge dq uh, to the uh, left plate of the capacitor. So that I add here some plus dq over time dt. There is a current, that current I can call I sub c, there is a voltage that I considered before as V sub c. So let's say that we have plus dq, an extra positive charge driven by the source to the left plate, the previously known as upper plate. I cannot call it the positive plate anymore because now I connect the capacitor to an alternating source. So there will be a positive and negative charging of the plate in an alternating basis, time alternating basis. So what happens then? You see, from this formula here, I conclude that if the charge increases by dq, the electric field also changes. So there will be a change in the electric field in the capacitor. And in fact, the change will be minus z dq, right? I'm taking here the formula. Since I add dq to this charge, it will be, this will be the new field. Uh, I mean, the difference 
that I will see in the field. Okay? So my field now changes. But now that the field changes, something else changes as well. We had seen in electrostatics that there is a, an electric field boundary condition at the interface between a dielectric and a conductor. So now, if I go to the lower plate, this is the lower plate, I see the new electric field Q plus DQ by epsilon WL that sinks on the plate. If you remember, the boundary condition says that if I have an interface between a dielectric and a conductor, so here I have a special case of this interface that we had seen between a conductor And the dielectric, the dielectric on this side is this epsilon, the dielectric of the capacitor. We had seen that uh, there is a boundary condition. If I draw here a normal unit vector at the boundary, and that the electric field to the left of the boundary, in fact, not the electric field, but the electric flux density, is equal to surface charge density at the boundary. So now, the change of the electric field tells me that there is also a change in the charge on the lower plate. Because now, you see if I apply this n hat points in the z direction, the electric flux density, remember, is dielectric permittivity times electric field. So if I multiply here epsilon times Q plus dQ by epsilon WL, epsilon changes. And now you see that my surface charge density on the lower on the right plate, uh, the previously lower plate, has actually changed as well. And uh, here the field points in the minus z hat direction. So z dot minus z is minus 1. So that means that my rho s at the lower plate, or right plate, has become minus q plus dq divided by wl, which means that now my lower plate has more negative charge by dq. So that now that I brought in plus dq here, I have minus dq on this side. And the mechanism for this is through the electric field. So the electric field built up on the left, and then it attracted this negative charge to the lower plate. And now, where has it found this negative charge? Obviously through the wire. That came from the wire which has been connected to the capacitor and that means that since this appeared here, there is now a plus dq on the wire because this minus dq has not, cannot be found anywhere else but the wire. And therefore that means that I pulled minus dq from the wire and now the wire has an excess positive charge dq. And what has just happened is actually remarkable because it is as if the electric field has made it possible for this situation to act out as if I had not ever connected the capacitor. Because you see that this dq has reappeared on this side. 
as if I had never the capacitor and that, that flow was happening through the wire without the interruption of the capacitor. Okay? So that is uh, something quite remarkable because I, I have inserted a dielectric in there. Right? I've inserted dielectric. Dielectric is insulator. So there is no current flow. The current flow has been interrupted here. However, now the electric field is developing. The electric field builds up, brings in minus dq. From where? From the wire. That means that now this, is, this has an excess charge plus dq, as if this dq came here. Of course, this and this are not the same charges. But the net effect is as if this wire had been connected to this side, and the capacitor was never there. In fact, uh, if you do the uh, math here, so let me just say that uh, the charge on lower plate decreased by minus dq. And that means that the wire on the right of the plate has an excess positive charge plus dq. So these uh, uh, plus charges dq on the left and the right are not the same, but the net effect is the same. So in other words, the electric field and the time variation of the electric field allows for an effect that is equivalent to a current. It, is, it plays out exactly as if I had a current in there. So this time variation that we saw in the electric field, this dE, which has happened over time dt, is equivalent to a current. Of course, I don't have a current through the capacitor. And that is the interesting thing about this and why we're talking about it in a course. Because I had a dielectric in there. I had an insulator. So there is no reason for a current to exist in there. But somehow we see the net effect of a current. This is actually, this effect that we just observed, and I will stop for any questions in a little bit, uh, is what we call the displacement current. So indeed we're talking about a current, but as you saw that comes from displacement of charges due to the electric field that is building up in the circuit rather than a current like the current that you have in wires where you have charges, electrons that are moving down the wire. So here we don't have such a current because we have inserted the capacitor. So I'll stop here. Any questions on what I have said so far? Yes. So when, when you say that time variation is equivalent to a circuit, you mean that the electric field is varying based on the time? So you see here that when there is current on the circuit that is time varying, for every instance that some dq here I am considering the positive cycle of the source. So the source has positive and negative cycles. So let's say that we are in a positive cycle, that we are looking at this side. So therefore, there is a current that brings in charges on this side. And I take a snapshot where some dq has arrived. So when this dq has arrived, the electric field inside the capacitor builds up. Because the electric field builds up, then although my source changed that dq, here, actually this one has to also change and will uh, become more negative by minus dq. And that means that the wire on the other side has actually become charged by plus dq as if it had connected directly without the capacitor to the other side of the wire. So what I said is that this effect play has the net effect of a current. So the variation of the electric field over this time interval dt had the net effect of a current.
it is as if I had connected directly the one side to the other. Right? So that's what I'm, I'm arguing. So this is called the displacement current. And in fact, if you notice this uh, dE by dt, is equal to minus z dq epsilon wl divided by dt. dq by dt, the time rate of change in the charge here, is equal to what? Current. current. It is this current. Is this I sub c. So this one is actually the current. So it is, in fact, the same current that is produced by the source. That means that uh, the electric flux density is equal to minus z. So if I multiply this by epsilon, I get IC by WL, which now means that if I calculate the flux of this vector, D, D by DT, if I calculate the flux of this vector through the capacitor, the area of the capacitor is actually WL. The area of the capacitor is WL. So if I take the flux of this through the area of the capacitor, let me take the flux uh, to the right. So. If I integrate, that is, this vector over the cross-section of the capacitor, ds, which is minus z hat dx dy. So I multiply this by this ds. See what I get. Minus z times minus z is 1. And then I have this current comes out of the integral. by WL times integral dx dy over the cross-section of the capacitor. But this integral is WL. So you see the flux of this time rate of change of the electric flux density through the area of the capacitor actually gives me exactly the current I see that goes to the capacitor. So the time change of the electric field is actually the agent that makes the circuit behave as if the capacitor wasn't there. And now we have uh, the current continuing on the other side. And of course, you couldn't have made this argument if this was a DC circuit, in which case nothing would change. D would say the same. And then, as you know, in DC, the capacitor acts as an open circuit. And once it charges, there is no more current flowing through the circuit. But now we have this electric field changing that is this agent of uh, this effect. And uh, this uh, d, d by dt, and in fact, the flux itself has a name. That name is displacement current. And the term displacement is there to indicate that obviously in a dielectric I cannot have a conduction current. It, so that is in 
contrast to the conduction current that involves the classical motion of electrons through conductors. And that displacement current, I sub d, is actually equal to, let me just put here, to this term. To be more precise, let me take the time derivative outside the integral. And this is displacement current through area S. So indeed you see that the units of this is amps. You can check this out because d by dt gives you 1 over second. The electric flux density is in coulombs per meter squared. ds is area, so it's meter squared. So you have coulombs per second, which is amps. So indeed, as we just saw in the analysis of this effect, we have something that behaves as a current, but is different from the ordinary current that you have in conductors. Now, James Clerk Maxwell was the first to actually notice that this displacement current, this term, should be added to Ampere's law. So, so in magnetostatics, we had used the Ampere law in this form when you have a closed path contour C and you take the closed path integral around this contour, closed path integral of the magnetic field, H dot DL, then on the right, you have to put the enclosed current. And the interpretation of this is that current produces magnetic field, just as we have seen in our demonstrations, that you can take a solenoid and that solenoid will produce a magnetic field. You don't need to extract a piece of rock uh, with magnetic properties to make a magnet. You can do this just with wires. And as you remember, we have the right hand rule whereby if we use our right hand to trace the loop, then your right hand thumb gives you the direction of positive current flow. So on the right, we have J dot DS, the enclosed conduction current. So this is the Ampere law. The Ampere Maxwell law that, uh, that Maxwell presented in 1865 is including a second term on the right hand side. The situation is exactly the same. The contour is exactly the same. But now on the right hand side, We have not just the conduction current, but now also the displacement current. So this is the Ampere Maxwell law. This law reminds us of Faraday's law. Faraday says that the electromotive force is equal to minus the time rate of change of magnetic flux through the circuit where you observe the electromotive force. Commonly, this can be interpreted as follows. 
time-varying magnetic field will actually produce a time-varying electric field. The Ampere-Maxwell law says that the opposite is also true. Time-varying electric field, so you don't need to have a current. Let's say we are here in free space and we are receiving a bunch of time-varying electric fields from access points of the wireless networks, from radio transmitters, from radio stations, from cellular communication transmitters. So right now, where we are standing, there is no conductor around us. However, there is a lot of time-varying electric fields. These are the electric fields that are generated by all these transmitters uh, for different services that we receive wirelessly. So, Amper Maxwell says that in here, we don't have a current because we are surrounded by air and air is an insulator, but we have time-varying electric field. And that is enough to produce an associated time-varying magnetic field. So this is the basis, those two laws are the basis of electromagnetic waves because they establish the interconnection of both electrical magnetic field and vice versa. I'll get back to this in a moment. Uh, but before that, I'll come back to my circuit with uh, the capacitor as an example of how the Ampere Maxwell law works and why it is important. So the example is again the same circuit we had before. I will draw the capacitor and I will give it a little bit of space here. This is still my alternating voltage source that produces a current, I sub C. And let me go and apply the Ampere Maxwell law on a contour that is a circular contour like this. We will apply this on a circular contour like this. This is my C. And I will trace it like this. Now that I have a C, I can also define S, the enclosed area. And this is my enclosed area for now. And. Uh, this is the associated DS. So how would Ampere Maxwell law look like in this case? Let me call this AM law. On the left, I have the magnetic field integral, what we called the magnetomotive force. So just like E dot DL is the electromotive force. This is the magnetomotive force. What do I have on the right in this case? Any ideas? Uh, you have uh, the, car the current channel too. Sorry, the uh, uh, differentiation of electric flux. So the electric field is here. And let's assume that the electric field is confined in the capacitor. So I have a disk that is being pierced by the wire. The electric field is somewhere else. So you see that this area will not enclose displacement current, will only enclose electric current. Again, I'm transferring this disk here, just so that you see it a bit more clearly. This is the disk. I'm tracing it like this. The wire comes in. pierces my area, carries the current I sub C through the area S. The electric field is on this side. 
So therefore, it is not participating in this application of the law. The right-hand side is simply I sub C. The current flows uh, consistently with the way that I have consistently with the way that I have uh, defined this positive sense of uh, current flux, dS. And there is no displacement current because the displacement current is here. You see, the, the red lines do not pierce the disk. Only the white line pierces the disk, right? Is that clear? The, the white line, the wire, goes through the disk. The red lines do not go through the disk. The disk is here, the red lines are there. So there is no second term. But, and this is a, an interesting thing um, observed by Maxwell, the choice of the area where I apply the Ampere Maxwell law is not unique. The surface S needs to be an open surface that terminates on the contour C. So I can choose another open surface. And here is a second choice of a surface. That will look like this. Here is my circuit. Here is the capacitor. This is my alternating source. Uh, my contour C is the same as before, so I choose exactly the same contour. But now my open surface, I choose it as follows. Imagine an inverted bowl that goes like this. Like a bowl of flowers that is open on the top so that I can put the flowers in the water. And then it actually closes on this side. This, in fact, is a valid choice of an open surface that terminates on the same contour. And now, what is important about the surface is that because it is open on the left, so the wire goes through, it doesn't cut, the wire does not cut the surface anymore. I have opened this side, therefore, the surface is what you see here, the shaded areas. So it's not ever cut itself by the wire. The wire just goes through, does not touch the surface, right? So you have the opening of the bowl, and then the wire goes through, does not cut the surface at all. But what cuts the surface is the electric flux lines. Now the surface, as you see, has uh, imagined that you came in with a blow dryer and this was uh, a plastic bag. And instead of being a disc, now it, it expands and includes the capacitor. So before I had a DS that points to the right, now I have a DS that still points to the right. What has happened here is that the left-hand side has remained the same. But the right-hand side now has no, this, no conduction current anymore because the wire does not cut ever the new surface. You see the wire is here and is here. On this side, the surface has an opening because it's an open surface. On this side, the, the surface has already terminated inside the capacitor. So the current never cuts uh, the surface. I can also give you a cross-sectional view that might be a little bit easier. 
to digest. So cross-sectional view. So this is the wire. This is the capacitor. My surface has an opening here and then goes in like this, comes back from the capacitor and closes like this. So you see that it's not cut by the current, but it is cut by the electric flux. OK, is that uh, clear? OK, go ahead. Yes. Doesn't that have to be closed? Like yes, the contour is closed. The contour is closed. The surface is open. The contour is closed. As you see here, this is a closed contour. So you do the line integral here. The contour closed means that the starting point is, uh, comes back and is, coincides with the end point. So this is a closed contour, but the surface is open. Imagine this is a ball of flowers, right? So the wire does not cut it anymore. So wherever you have D, DS you have here, you have here, you have here, you have here, you have here. This is a D dot DS integral. And this is a J dot DS integral. For this to be non-zero, you have to have current, you have to have DS. So on this side where you have current, you don't have DS. Because the ball of flowers is open. Okay, so DS exists here, 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 exists here, but it does not exist here. So wherever you have current, you don't have DS. You have current here, but you don't have DS because the ball has already terminated inside. Okay, so that is the difference. And now, if I um, apply the law, I don't have conduction current, but I have displacement current. D dot DS. And uh, my displacement current D, I will use now the second expression we gave for the electric field. So remember the electric field in the capacitor is voltage divided by separation of plates. So now I will use the voltage of the capacitor you see the electric field, so if this is voltage V sub C, the electric field is minus V sub C over H, and then the electric flux density is minus Z hat epsilon V sub C over H. Okay, so this is the second uh, expression that I will use. So the electric flux density is minus Z hat epsilon V sub C over H. And now the displacement current, if I apply this formula, let me uh, make some space here. D by dt, electric flux, so notice the symmetry in the electric and the magnetic laws, the Faraday and the Ampere Maxwell law. Magnetic flux in Faraday, electric flux in, um, in uh, the Ampere Maxwell law. It is this duality between electric and magnetic fields that enables the electromagnetic wave propagation that all this wireless revolution that 99% of anything that we do in ECE, software or hardware, is based upon because even data that we're producing, unless it's transmitted wirelessly, it ceases to be that useful, is based upon this duality of electric and magnetic effects. So now if I go and do this flux calculation through the area of the capacitor, I have d over dt. My electric flux is z hat. My DS, you see points opposite to the z-axis. The z-axis is like this. So as we saw before, the DS is minus z dx dy. 
This is an easy integral, like most integrals in this course, by the way, that are very easy. Z dot Z, Z dot Z is 1. There is nothing to integrate. Uh, epsilon, H are constants. They go out. V sub C goes out, and it is the only time varying quantity that will be differentiated. And then I have dx dy over the area of the capacitor. which is WL. So again, uh, this is our, um, this was L in our notation previously. This is W. So this is nothing else but WL. So we have epsilon WL over H dVC by dt. So now the quantity that you see up here we saw it in the beginning of the lecture. Anybody remembers what this is? Capacitance. The capacitance. We saw it in the beginning of the lecture. Unfortunately, this is not a very big board, so that you could see everything we've said today. But uh, if you go back to your notes, sorry, you will see that this one here is the capacitance, C. So our, our result is that the displacement current is C dVC by dt. In both, in both cases, the left-hand side was the same. In the first case, the right-hand side was current of the inductor, of the capacitor. In the second case, the right-hand side was C dV by dt. Therefore, for these two cases to be consistent with each other, for these two cases to be consistent with each other, since you had the same left-hand side, you have to have the same right-hand side. And that means that I sub C is C dVC by dt. So you see if you compare 1 and 2, since you have to have the same right-hand side, the left-hand sides being equal, you have to have I sub C, the current of the capacitor, equal to C dV by dt. You may say, what's a big deal about this? I knew this uh, for a long time, and indeed, the current voltage relation of the capacitor is the Ampere Maxwell law. Notice that if Maxwell had not added this second term to the law, in the second case, we would have found right hand side equal to zero. And then these two would not be consistent with each other. The uh, result of this exercise, had it not been for the second term in the Ampere Maxwell law, the displacement current, the result of this exercise would have been I sub C equal to zero. That is, would have been the result that is consistent with what we know for DC circuits. That there is no current through a circuit that includes a capacitor at DC. But at AC is the displacement current that saves the day and makes this consistent. So I uh, stop this lecture today with the note that the current voltage relation, the capacitor, is the Ampere Maxwell law. So we saw that the current voltage relation at the inductor is the Faraday law applied to the inductor. And now we see the same for the capacitor for the Ampere Maxwell law. Yes, please. Sorry. So the displacement current exists wherever electric field exists. So in this case, as you see here from the term, so unless you have an electric field, then you don't have displacement current, time varying electric field. Uh, so here, in this diagram, I assume that all the electric field is concentrated within the capacitor, and therefore there is no leakage outside, and hence that's where it exists. The wire is just too thin to produce an electric field. Yes? Uh, just to confirm, is the uh, IC equal to IC? Like, is that what it yes, is? that's right. Yes. So the displacement current acts to continue the conduction current through the capacitor where you don't have conduction electrons anymore due to the dielectric. ID is equal IC. Yes, you stated that very correctly. I should have said it myself. Confirm, yes. uh, we use alternating current source just because we want to change the uh, charge of 
yeah, you see, if you didn't have alternating current and alternating voltage, you wouldn't have a displacement current. And then I sub C would be 0. Like you know for DC circuits. In DC circuits, the capacitor is an open circuit. Right? OK. So thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll continue tomorrow.